Welcome to the CS340 Winter 2021 edition. This is a discussion of the history of human computer interaction. What is human computer interaction? It is a science of the artificial. It's a science that explores how people interact with the artificial device that society has created called the computer. And it, that explores how people actually use the computer and what works and what doesn't and how the computer influences and changes people. About 48% of application code in 1992 was user interface focused. So you have a very high chance of building some part of an interface when you graduate from this program if you go on to be a computer programmer, even if you are not a user experience designer. And my guess is that this number has gone up, although I don't know of any recent studies. Now, technology's allure has been part of society's vision of itself for a very long time. And for almost all of that time, people have envisioned the ways in which technology can free them up to be mobile and communicate and compute in many different settings. Here I'm showing Robita's vision of a cordless telegraph from 1906, a very um, prospective image at the time. And this concept of technology's use for communication and mobile communication continues in 1929. We see a commercial vision of a wireless private video phone. And here in um, 1945, one of the most famous articles that was written about the future of computing, written by Vannevar Bush in um, the Atlantic Monthly, was called As We May Think. And he posited a desk that had uh, the ability to instantly bring files and material on any subject to the operator's fingertips. His image or vision of the future included hyperlinks, communication, and many of the kinds of applications that we take for granted today. Around the same time, people were already envisioning smartwatches as well, and this captured the popular imagination that's shown in this Dick Tracy stamp. And people were inventing the interaction technologies that made all of this possible. One of the earlier such inventors, um, a leader in computer graphics was Ivan Sutherland. And in 1964, he created the Sketchpad graphical communication system. This image shows it in action. It has pen-based input, corded input from many different buttons, and the ability to link things, assign constraints, draw pictures, create diagrams, all sorts of things that were well ahead of their time. Many of these um, could have been a single PhD thesis today, and all of them were part of his PhD thesis. His work inspired the inventor of the mouse, Douglas Engelbart. And Engelbart um, also uh, invented a working version, not just a vision of hypertext. He invented the concept of windowing systems, graphics, video conferencing, word processing, dynamic file linking, revision control, and collaborative real-time editing. And I strongly encourage you to take a look at what was called the mother of all demos, because all of these things were part of that demo, which was presented on December 9th of 1968 at the Fall Joint Computer Conference. These were exciting times when many changes were happening. Oops, I started the demo. Yep, and you're on. You'll have to watch it for yourselves. Around that time, the computer, personal computer revolution also began. And I have links here to the uh, uh, Silicon Valley Computer History Museum, which just has an amazing slideshow of images and events that I've excerpted a few from in these next few slides. Email was invented in 1971. The first commercial graphical user interface was introduced in 1973 on the Xerox Alto. The Xerox never made any mo money off of this, but the modern GUI was inspired by those innovations and was popularized in the Apple Lisa and beyond. Um, and in 1973, the first capacitive touchscreen was developed at CERN, and that's the technology that's used today on your mobile phones. In the 80s, we saw what you might call wave one of human computer interaction, which is um, the uh, commercialization of personal computing, both mobile and desktops. Um, and in 1984, the first commercially available cell phone became available, the Dynatech 8000X, and it was quite large. I think you can see it in uh, small in this picture here being held by Peter Lewis, 
who was an innovator um, at the time, he spoke before Congress, before the Congressional Black Caucus, and coined the term Internet of Things, which has become a catchword today, but was visionary at the time. Um, and personal computers hit the mass market. Around that time, it also became clear that user interface toolkits were needed to build all of the different kinds of interfaces people were exploring. And Smalltalk 80 was the first language that supported that. It was invented by Adele Goldberg, shown in this picture at the bottom. In the 90s, we saw the beginning of truly commercial and accessible collaboration and communication. The World Wide Web was introduced, which brought hypertext into the mainstream as a document publishing mechanism by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, echoing the vision of Vannevar Bush. And the first popular web browser was introduced in 1993, when I was on internship at Argonne National Labs and built one of their first web pages. In 1996, the Palm Pilot was introduced that was a, um, uh, the first portable computing machine that you could interact with apps on, although they were all uh, Palm specific. And also the machine that I used the day I decided I was gonna get my PhD. Um, in 1998, the first portable MP3 player was released and um, Hiroshi Ishii pictured here began pioneering innovative methods in tangible computing, which I'm sure we'll touch on some of since much of my research today is in fabrication. Going into the 2000s, we saw wave two of collaboration and communication. And the launch of the iPhone in 2007, perhaps, is the most um, well-known um, innovation in this space. Mobile apps hit the mass market in 2009. Um, and in, I have a picture here of Deborah Estrin, who was um, a pioneer of mobile health technology and won a MacArthur Genius Award for her work. In the 2010s, we saw technology being used for self-expression and social change. And starting in late 2010 and continuing through 2011, um, it became famously the case that social media supported protests and regime change in the Middle East. We see in the human computer interaction research field, a diversification of focus and impact um, with computers being studied in many different contexts and also a diversification in input and output um, the first smartwatch is released and the options for different kinds of mobile interaction in proliferate. Um, new kinds of interaction techniques, new sensors, new device forms, um, and increasing accessibility and attention to accessibility so that screen reading became possible on mobile devices. And yes, I'm focusing a little bit on mobile here since that is a focus of our course. I also have to relate, however, before we stop this history, that many of computing history's most shameful moments involve HCI in some way. First of all, in a report that was released in 1994, over 1,000 separate deaths due to computer-related accident, accidents were documented in the decade between 1979 and 1989. As far as I know, this data is not being collected um, currently, it wasn't directly being corrected even during the period covered by that report that was painstakingly put together from news reports and other things. And it's worth asking yourself what kind of obligation we have as a field to um, sign a do not harm oath or think about death as a risk of the work that we do. But that's not the only risk that matters. Um, in 2015, Google's image recognition algorithm famously tagged a black person as a gorilla. Um, as of 2018, the best fix they had was a hard-coded solution, uh, AI, which is, of course, its own field, but also expressed through interfaces, is still deeply flawed. In 2016, we hear in the news this question of whether fake news distributed through social media changed the outcome of an, of an election. In 2017, the Hawaii missile gaffe correct, incorrectly warned of an incoming nuclear missile. Um, I have a student who was on the big island at the time, and she and her uh, fiance received on their phones this warning that they might not survive the day. It was a strikingly horrible mistake. Um, luckily, recoverable, and only took a few hours, I believe, before they sent out a correction. In 2019, discussions increased about the need to address algorithmic bias in healthcare, and articles did the research to show how race is baked into healthcare. This is particularly problematic because consumers do not get to find out how algorithms are making decisions, and often even the people using the algorithms don't know. 
And of course, in 2020, we hear the news about algorithms leading to the false arrest of a black man. And this is not the first time that that's happened, but it's the article I was able to find in the news, as far as I know. If not arrest, certainly false identification of possible criminals, quote unquote, has been happening for a while now. So these are just a sample of some of the more shameful moments of human use of technology. And I want you to take those thoughts along with the beautiful visions that we saw into a, uh, a moment of thought about how we invent a preferable and inclusive future. What should that future look like? What will it look like if we think hard about how to do it and do it right? And who needs to help design the future for us to achieve this? Who do we need to include in the development of technology? How do, and who needs to be able to use technology of the future, future for us to achieve this? These are all questions that we should be asking ourselves whenever we go into technology development. So this is a question we'll discuss in lecture. How is technology changing us as individuals in society and what do we want it to be? To summarize, welcome to the class. All of HCI was already invented in the 1920s, sort of. HCI has a huge influence on individuals in society and one that we need to take responsibility for as a field. And I'd like to throw this out there that no computer program was ever built without the intent that some person would use it. So technically you're in a class that covers all of computer science and certainly should have an influence on all of the ways in which computers are used. Thank you for your time. <laughs>